we uh, are going to have a panel now. Uh, we entitled it um, Limits of Open Source and Extreme Scale Storage Systems Design. Uh, it includes a bunch of very distinguished uh, colleagues um, and accomplished experts in this field. Uh, Peter Brahm, who spoke earlier this morning, developer of Luster, and now uh, working in the campaign storage area with his new startup. Sean Roberts, who's worked with OpenStack Consortium and a bunch of other very uh, advanced uh, open source projects for doing uh, clouds and other big systems. And then, of course, our other speaker, David Bonney, this morning um, with Los Alamos. So um, the, the genesis of this particular panel uh, was the program committee met, um, uh, this was about three or four months ago, and we were discussing various topics. And um, I, I, uh, Ellen Salmon was on. And so, Ellen, make, you need to, you should jump in here, too, at some point. But basically, the question was, well, you know, um, these extreme sales systems are, you know, they require um, a lot of uh, complex development. You don't find architects of uh, the caliber of the folks on this panel just randomly walking around the street. There's, they're kind of few in number. They usually have to make a living. Um, so expecting like some kind of like this, uh, small uh, nutshell of a project to balloon, although, you know, David's proof that uh, it doesn't take a lot of people to make some very interesting things happen. So, um, so the, 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 this is sort of a loose panel, but the basic idea is um, what, how far can we go in terms of building system, you know, extreme scale schisms with open source? Do we want to just use it as a set of components? Um, do we want to have, make sure that the entire design is open source? And if the entire design is open source, that then begs the question, what's, is there a business model? Because we're extreme scale is typically a small number of systems. So then it, require, it might require some kind of funding. Uh, we have uh, folks from the various parts of the federal government here tell us about, you know, can they long-term fund, things like that. So that's the general uh, gist. So is that enough to get you guys started? Or, and uh, if you want to throw some other uh, thoughts in as well. So we could start with, uh, anybody want to start? Or I could start at the end with Sean. Do you want to, do you have an, any opening statements? <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so, so uh, re regarding the, the setting of this discussion, I, I think the first thing that came to my mind thinking about is, this, is that when you ask for a limit, you, you, are, you are looking at a boundary. And, and there are boundaries, I think, between open source and business, uh, but there are also boundaries between storage software in particular and open source. And I, I think that that is the area where I want to go first. I think it's, you know, the enormous success of Linux has not at all been achieved for storage software that is open source. Yet this valley is littered with proprietary companies, proprietary products that have never made it into Linux. And I, I think that this is a, a, a big tragedy somehow, uh, that I say that not as a business person, but as somebody who loves open source, it's a big tragedy that the openness has not gone very far with, with the software. The flip side of that is to look at the limits for the business side. And I think the, that may explain perhaps also why many things have not been made open source. The, the problem is money. Developing software is extremely expensive and somehow wallets open for hardware they do not open for software development. Yeah, it is very, very difficult to get somebody to fund an open source project and do that at a level that uh, can, can generate something that is of lasting value. And um, so I, I think it's a, something I cannot answer, but these are sort of my two key observations is that I think there's a, a barrier with what, what money is available to do it. And sadly, there is, you know, a, a big limit to the results that have been achieved. <laughs> so, um, I would generally agree. Um, the, invariably, the problem ends up being that uh, the hardware side of storage isn't well understood by software developers and vice versa. Um, so, uh, good software projects have a tendency to die because of misconfigured hardware and lack of understanding how to, how to build and, and uh, implement. Um, that being said, I, I think in the last few years, last maybe six, seven years, um, there have been 
um, some commercial open source um, uh, projects that have been relatively successful, um, Ceph and Swift being um, two of the, the most notable. Um, I, full disclosure, I happen to know the founders of both those organizations, so um, I, I have a little bit of personal uh, bias there, but um, they have been, uh, one was the technology was acquired by Red, uh, Red Hat and um, put alongside Gluster and has been relatively well sold and successful, and Swift is a independently operating and, and, and profitable um, company that's, that's um, that software is all open source as well, but still um, without well configured hardware, both of those software storage systems do not work well. And generally the complaints you hear from people that complain um, either one of those products or open uh, software defined storage in general is bad, it's, it's generally um, lack of knowledge of how to properly configure the hardware itself. Before um, David, uh, and I'd also like to, there's the uh, mic up there, and so um, I really encourage people, you know, feel free to jump up any time during the panel, so just consider yourselves all part of the panel. If you have something, you know, if you'd like to add an initial briefing, whatever, just feel free to jump up. So, but use that mic in the middle, please. Well, I'd say I just, I, I mirror uh, Peter's thoughts on this, and that it's very hard to find funding to get software developed at a scale of this sort, where a minor mistake uh, early on could cost you the viability of the project when you scale it up. Um, I mean, it's been pulling teeth trying to get funding to build MarFS to what it is now, um, and even that was only two and a half people worth of time for the past couple of years. Um, so it ends up being a small project, even at something that's as big scale as this. So it's it's tough. Cool. Yeah, I think that the technical difficulties that you mentioned, they are definitely there. Um, and, but, but, but it's also very surprising. So why can the Linux kernel support like, you know, a hundred different CPU models and not several hardware enclosures and, uh, you know, get the performance right, get the LEDs to blink, offer these cozy enclosure services. Yeah, none of it is really there. Well, I think if it comes down to the model for Linux is, is sort of, there, there's sort of an oligarchy around Linux. And that's partly driven by, you know, interest level of people that you know want to, want to be involved with it, and then Linus's judgment about those particular people, and and then it's it's just this actually gets to my first point that I wanted to make, which is that Peter Levine actually wrote he's a he's a VC at Andreessen Horowitz, and he wrote a blog that I wish I would have, would have wrote because I fully agree with it. But but he was actually the CEO at Zensaurus before that. He was the CEO and helped drive uh, you know uh, Veritas to great heights. But the net of what what he basically said is the issue with um, open source is it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have kind of a regular product management sort of infrastructure, uh, except in, in some exceptions. And so, in general, it's, an, it's a somewhat diffuse pool. This is speaking about Linux in particular. It's kind of a diffuse pool of developers that I think as long as you're kind of right down the mainstream of how people use it, number one, uh, and you're sort of in the, in the, in the zone of like, this is, this is supporting POSIX, this is a, a well-established, decades-long framework, it basically works. But um, when you want to innovate way outside the box, and that in a way that's not interesting to that core group, it's, um, it's even difficult to sometimes get that technology into the kernel or around it. So what, what do you, what's, your, what's your thought about that? Um, I, I actually think that the kernel community is very open-minded. Um, uh, so I got experimental file systems into the kernel twice um, and they added new little pieces to the VFS and so on for me very, very quickly. I, I think it comes down to, you know, have, building a reasonable relationship and, and being responsible about it. I, I somehow don't think that they're the obstacle, honestly. I think the, 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 the core of this problem lies somewhere else. I would say, um, so I used to work on PVFS and OrangeFS now, um, and getting that source code into the kernel was a very, very long road. Um, and perhaps that's because it was viewed as an academic sort of testing file system, but um, it took on the order of five years to get into the Linux kernel. Um, so I think there's just that if there's not a use case for the common user, 
there is a lot of resistance into getting it into the kernel at that point. Yeah, I think, so Peter, I think uh, I, I wouldn't actually disagree with you. I think it's just that it's sort of, you. some people have different experiences. So in your case, uh, it's, you know, I think certainly you came at it from a, a technical, you know, obviously somebody they respect, and then it must, you know, lined up. But I, I've seen the same thing, like two different topics. One might slide, slide in, might one, one and another might not. I can say for a fact, though, I'm not going to name names or anything, but th there are specific innovations that happened uh, in the storage system software stack in Linux that that got bottlenecked going up through kind of the layer of kernel people be below Linux that should never, never, in my personal opinion, shouldn't have gotten bottled up. The people that were working on them were very talented um, and I think well respected, but uh, the, the, the thing, one of the things that is missing is in a, in a normal software development, say commercial software development project, there's something called product management and product management's driven by the sales, sales guys yelling at, not directly at the engineers, they yell at product management and then product management goes to engineering and says, hey, you need to do this. So that's why everybody hates product management, by the way, it's like one of the toughest jobs in, 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 in a company. But um, in Linux, it's, if somebody, you know, if there's something that needed, commercially needed that you just mentioned, there really is no, not even in Red Hat, I worked at Red Hat, there truly isn't, you, even product management at Red Hat can't force the developers to do something even if it's really deeply needed by customers, so. John, do you wanna add, go um, ahead. So a couple comments, I guess the first one is with the, the uh, title of this talk, you're obviously trying to avoid controversy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my second comment is you're, you're talking about Linux, which is great, I love Linux, but I think the fundamental problem with open source, source uh, storage systems, especially those at extreme scale, have less to do with the kernel and more to do with the operational parameters under which those systems are operating, how they're tested, how they're verified, and how they're run in production. Storage is hard. Everyone in th this room probably realizes that, right? And it takes a long time and a lot of effort to develop a system where someone can put their data, that they're gonna trust it, and it's not gonna corrupt their, their data or have problems with their data. If you put a Linux kernel on a compute node and you play with that kernel and you run into some scheduling issues or something, oh, I'll just reboot the compute node and life goes on. You don't have that luxury in a lot of storage systems. Going back or rebooting or if something goes bad, People get sensitive if you corrupt their data or if it becomes unavailable. So that's part of the problem as well. So I don't think it's Linux. You can talk about a variety of different open source kernels, Linux being one of them. Obviously, there's a lot of different distros. You could talk about BSD. But I really think there's something fundamentally different about storage and specifically storage at scale. And I, I don't think it's necessarily an open source problem, but I think open source has aggravated this situation, and I'll tell you what I mean. For a lot of companies, they look at open source projects and they go, well, I'll just take A, B, and C, I'll take some tape and some wire and we'll wrap it up and we'll call the system and we'll go out and sell it. And there's some companies that do that. And A, B, and C were never really intended to run together really well. Now you have an issue. And everyone wants to, everyone wants something, but they don't want to put the effort in. So a lot of companies, not going to point fingers in the room, a lot of companies want to be able to use open source projects to build products to sell to, to, to customers. The national labs want to do what the national labs want to do. They want to do production computing or they want to do their research computing. They want to write papers. So everyone wants to do their little thing but very few people want to fund the people like Dave to go off and do the really hard work or to sit there and do regression testing after regression testing, many man months worth of effort to make sure the systems are reliable. So I think, so the, your, sorry. So your point is that um, it's not just the software that could be developed by the team, but actually the funding around like the, the actual, uh, you know, full, full scale testing and hardening and it's some the, of the hardening, you, it's Peter the production use, yeah. it's everything that goes in it. And, and Peter should be well aware of this having gone through his gray hair period with Luster. Uh, it's the exact same thing, right? There's a lot of Luster systems where if you run Luster, 
adding 250 nodes, it, it's perfectly fine. But if you get up to a certain scale and you're doing something funny, you're off on the rough corner or the rough edge, maybe it's not, as, it's, it's not going to work as well. Although if the attitude about open source is right, that's potentially a good thing, right? Because that's the whole point. As, as Peter did releases of Luster, they were going across multiple labs. You had, well, you know, but, they, but that, open that's source, part of how it's supposed open, to work, but, right? But, but open, source only, <laughs> open source in that methodology only works for if it's someone in their bedroom at night that comes home and does some coding. So, so I don't buy this at all. Uh, if Linux can run on billions of Android phones, which rarely ever get corrupted data, yeah, on the entire internet, what's in the cloud, is basically running Linux. Their storage systems are pretty darn good. And well, I, in fact, but, but, I think but, that but an you're, even you're greater failure than the open source development of storage software the is the company, are the company's software. But you're confusing the end use, aren't you? Me, you, me using my uh, phone to store my contacts is different than Los Alamos running nuclear weapons code. It's actually not different from the Veritas file system, for example. Yeah, it's, it's the same kind of local sort of recovery that, uh, you know, is extremely well developed. So I, I'll let David I don't really think that, that commercial <laughs> I don't think software can lay a claim to saying, being a lot better. Yeah? I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I don't know if David would believe it. I've worked in DOE. The applications that people write are not nearly as well behaved as you'd like, them to, like, to, like to believe them to be. And the science that's used at these extreme scales, whether it's bioinformatics, uh, fusion energy research, uh, plasma dynamics, uh, computational fluid dynamics, finite elements codes, all these codes can push file systems in some very extreme ways. And those are the sorts of things you're not going to find on your Android phone. And that's all I'll say. So I, I think you your points are well taken, but I think you confused a few things. And let me explain what I, what I mean. So um, the, the experience of running at scale um, a, a few very huge clusters as opposed to millions of phones, you know, radically different experience. So putting that aside, we're talking about a, a small number of really large clusters uh, of um, storage systems. And that, ex that operational experience, um, historically, most of the organizations uh, tend to jump towards uh, when they're going to make a, a, a spend of millions of dollars, they're going to jump towards somebody that can give them support. So um, over time, uh, more organizations have gotten more experience with um, different uh, non-commercial um, sources, um, like uh, uh, Ceph was installed um, and is basically uh, running all of uh, the image processing and storage at uh, Yahoo for probably the last four years. Um, and that's many hundreds of petabytes of data, and it runs just fine. Um, so uh, historically before that, there was all NetApp. Um, it, this is just one example. And the reason why they did that is uh, for no other reason other than they had a really strong relationship with NetApp. It, wasn't that Yahoo wasn't using a lot of open source already, it was the strength of the support relationship with NetApp was stronger than the desire to try out um, something that was cheaper and maybe more, even more scalable. So once that friction uh, became uh, low enough, they went with the, the cheapest, most viable option they could, which happened to be Ceph at the time. So I, I think all organizations have the same experience and if you can have a few people that develop um, enough experience or are smart enough to be able to support Ceph the same way they support EMC or NetApp or any of the other commercial versions or any of the IBM versions or um, traditional um, Linux operating system or uh, file systems, then that's what you'll go with. So um, there's just been a lot of inertia for many, many years to support commercial versions because that's what the institutional knowledge was. That's the operational experience. So. I don't think open source had as much to do with it, personally. Um, so I'll just add to that. I mean, there's the common saying, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. I mean, that exists because somebody want a, some entity to point a finger at. And I think that's something that gets lost in translation between the people working on a problem and the, the managers sometimes, is the managers want to be able to point a finger at somebody that isn't someone that works for them. Um, I, I 
will admit I don't have that opinion. I like being pointed at and said, you screwed it up, go fix it. Um, <coughs> but I am an outlier in that aspect. Um, so I can see why having an open source system that you have to self-support could be a problem for a lot of companies because you have people that just don't understand why is the thing broken. It's just supposed to work. I paid so much money for all these developers and so much money for all this hardware. Why is it broken? And then you have to go point at your own local people. So, so, so do you think that the aggregate cost of that support um, is actually higher or lower than doing the right kind of product development and finishing these kind of configuration issues off and management issues off so that the product is really widely usable? Because I think that that's the, the common theme in our discussion is perhaps that that's where the boundary is of, of the usability. Yeah, so it, it doesn't become usable enough perhaps to mm -hmm. spread really very far in many cases. Right. Right, so it's like, especially in the MarFS case, I know it has some rough edges um, in terms of configuration and, and stand up, and it, we have only really called it on the systems that we've built it for. Um, so as you expand that out, it, it, having that support is difficult, and I, I think it's good for growing people, but it's not great for growing revenue if you're trying to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd share my experience with trying to, uh, we, at NASA Goddard, we tried to, or I personally tried, I uh, have been working on a uh, entirely open source, uh, large scale storage project that uses uh, MD-ADM uh, RAID extensively and, and simple JBOD. So there's no, there's no hardware incompatibilities with what I'm doing. You know, we just have JBODs presenting, <clears throat> presenting a bunch of disk. We started out with uh, using Gluster, and that seemed plenty promising for, uh, until we got with, you know, when we were had 15, 20 users maybe. Once the base started growing, we started incurring, you know, oddball problems that involved it. I'm not shy about poking around under the hood. There were a number of Gluster problems I fixed, poking around, you know, varlib, Gluster D, et cetera, et cetera, and manipulating content and values, and that sort of thing to fix the files. The problem is that there's not, there's very little tolerance for, unlike other fields, which was pointed out earlier, there's very little tolerance for uh, risk in data storage, particularly within, particularly within the agency, you know, if, if we try a new technology for our compute systems and they're down for a day, well, we lost a day of wall time. You lose data, you know, years of somebody's work could be down the drain. So there's just very little tolerance for that. And uh, <clears throat> eventually we shifted over to uh, make use of GPFS as a function of that with all the same to underlying technology. And that has scaled uh, seamlessly up to about 15 petabytes today. So it's, it's kind of my feeling that <clears throat> a lot of open source developers don't have the means to test their implementation at scale without support of customers. And so the customers end up becoming a lab of sorts for that. And you know, I, I work out as much tolerance as I can for allocating hardware and testing that sort of thing, but there, there are limitations. So do you think it would be a better world if um, customers somehow were more supportive of the finishing touches on the open source, more complex software products that we're talking about? Maybe. It's a, it's a tough problem to solve. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's money. Behind. There, there are financial issues behind trying to to test a scale like that. And it's, it's really difficult to test every kind of scenario you might run into. You know, one problem we had with Gluster was uh, semaphore handling. Um, if user X runs a, the same make dir command on 20 nodes, well, it'll, it's gonna work on one of them and it's gonna return a non-zero on 19 of those. And, the develop and we have a lot of lazy developers who, you know, expect that kind of functionality to not yield errors and there's, you know, a thousand cases like that I can mention, and it's—I don't know how you test everything you can that can happen to data at a data center in a lab environment. Honestly, I realize I'm not throwing out solutions. <laughs> it's just you well, know. Well, I think um, okay. So we can—we certainly can agree that that uh, something like Linux, it's very broadly used. It has a kind of a base. It's a—it's a—it has a base level of 
you know, high level of development. There's other, R, you know, components, R-Sync, or just many, 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 you know, fairly simple, you know, whatever, moderate sized pieces of software. But so what I think we're hearing multiple times from you and from John is that once you get into these, these potentially large scale situations, then it becomes, okay, uh, how, how, do you, how do you maybe uh, collaboratively test across multiple organizations so that that's, you know, so that, that that helps you move the ball forward. And I think you've had more experience. What's your thoughts there? Because you've had more experience than all of us. And then, so Sean, first of all, I, I, yeah. I think that the, the portrait that, uh, that you are sketching of Luster is actually completely wrong. Like Luster, today, not, yeah. not, not Luster, Gluster, G-L-U-S-T. Ah, G-L-U-S-T, so I, no, no, I know no. very little about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think that to some degree, you see, Ceph and Luster have benefited sufficiently to become very widely accepted. By the way, Swift probably too. Yeah, these are what you would call probably success stories. Yeah, but, but I think for that, for any of these success stories, there are many other systems that somehow didn't make it. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned this morning, there is actually a need for a different kind of object store. Yeah, that, that the labs have been asking for, and probably many people would use it if it, if it was available. And so I don't, I think it's not a few systems. It's, you know, why are there hundreds and hundreds of su successful companies that get acquired for, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, yeah, for, you know, a library of deduplication software or some, you know, many raid companies got bought and so on. What would have happened if that money had been given back in some organized form of open source development, which by the way, maybe OpenStack has much more the, the right kind of model for it than uh, the current storage development for Linux. Yeah, I, uh, I'm quite open to say Some of the Linux different. storage development doesn't suit our needs very well because there seems to be a shift away from POSIX file systems with uh, Swift and Ceph. And I know there is support for POSIX, but it was kind of a, an afterthought in Ceph rather than the forefront. And for us, that's a huge, huge problem because we have so much legacy code that has no maintainers to it anymore, but is still, you know, blessed to uh, produce useful scientific outputs. And we don't have, you know, we don't have the staff to suddenly inherit and modify all those, all those codes to work with, uh, you know, outside the confines of a POSIX file system. Yeah, I would say that uh, most of the new storage technologies that I've seen be successful are internet focused and definitely um, they'll bolt on something like Fuse to support right. POSIX, but it's it's definitely not the focus. Right, so and communities like mine terrible. are getting left behind as a function of that. Yeah, so um, I, I don't see that likely changing. Um, if anything, it's gonna become more of a problem. Right. Um, <laughs> Just because of the scale of the data sets that the, comp uh, the organizations or the, the problems that they're trying to solve are just getting so much larger, so much faster. Um, it, you know, data science just as a field is just getting going. So um, it's, 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 it's only going to get more extreme so that the support for POSIX is, is going to uh, perhaps unintentionally become more and more uh, tenuous. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that uh, just to go back a little bit, the, the only companies that I know of that um, storage-wise that support, or I should say the, the projects that I know of that are um, focused on storage that I, I think that have been pretty successful that are open source based um, have a strong company or organization behind it that happen to open source the tech for um, because they, they felt like it was the right reason, but they, there's definitely a commercial aspect to it. So Swift has Swift Stack, um, and Ceph has DreamHost, which they, um, they sold the, the technology, um, or the, the support organization, I, I mean, um, to uh, Red Hat. But um, there's always, the only reason Ceph existed, or the major reason why Ceph existed, was to support the hosting company. Um, so, um, you know, it wasn't built for altruistic reasons. Well, yeah, therein lies a point. So uh, when Peter Levine wrote his blog, you know, 
he, uh, he basically said the issue with open source companies, so this gets back to what we're all talking about, is which is we know we've got great technology, we know we can make some things happen, but how do you make those finishing touches, how do you make that full product? And Peter Levine's point was that uh, his, in his observation, he's the CEO of ZenSource, is they, open, the open source as a business model doesn't give you enough margin, it doesn't give you enough cash flow to fund, refund, basically fund development, sales, and support. So um, Red Hat is sort of the outlier of a of a what 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 you would think of as like a large scale publicly publicly traded you know company right, but even Red Hat is I think thirty market cap of twenty five billion thirty billion I mean Microsoft's three hundred billion Oracle one hundred sixty um, so 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 the question is um, you know uh, is if Peter Levine is is correct, and I tend to believe he is. If I look at just the the available evidence, it's how do you know how do we as a community? Because uh, a lot of us are either companies like Oracle, where we leverage Linux every obviously in, in many many products. Uh, one of which I'll be talking about shortly. Uh, you're at Eileen uh, Ellen Salmon at NASA. We've got folks from other agencies here. How do you you know you do want the technologies that folks innovators like Peter can bring to the, Peter Brom can bring to the table. Um, but how do you cooperate with him? How do, how do we create models where we can, we can get that last mile and everybody can win? Yeah, so can the last mile actually be achieved without some kind of a buyout? You see, because the common theme yeah. about <laughs> the, the sort of examples we are discussing is that they all at some point got a pretty good cash injection or support from a big company. Yeah, and I mean, it's true, and I think, I think that points to the fact that there's obviously a clear levels of success and a clear level of utility uh, but, and it's worked, right? I mean, you know, Lustre's been it provided a tremendous amount of storage and, and, and uh, you know, Ceph and these other, these other projects, but uh, it's, it, we're sort of making it, uh, I think we're still kind of making it up as we go in terms of try to, trying to make it happen, uh, keep it consistent, and I think when folks, decision makers like, uh, you know, Ellen and others at the agencies, they have to, you know, they have to, um, they, they want the benefits of open source, the openness, the, the, the things they can change, but they want to manage the costs. I think that's what you're saying too, so, yeah. Cool, all right, um, any last comments from panel members or any uh, final comment from folks in the audience? Uh, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm from a, a Pittsburgh Super Computing Center. We do have a, a uh, could you uh, speak, uh, speak yeah, more? Yeah, we do okay. have a fire alarm fire system. So I fully echo the uh, sentiments uh, expressed by previous audience. So we have like 150 million files, like six, five petabyte storage. So it's very, it's very hard to, uh, to test such an environment in the, in the open source community because we have different kind of scientist uh, applications do all kinds of weird things. So I don't think the open source community can do that. And just because you can get the source code into the kernel doesn't mean it's going to be a lot of people. Going to Unless you're David Bonney, right. and you have. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's but my, you're right. Not, not everybody's David Bonney. Yeah. So that's that's my that's my comments. But, but could somebody from the labs maybe comment whether testing with an open source product is in any way different from testing with a commercial product? Well, it's it's very difficult because uh, the, we have many we have a file system called Slash Tool. Because we have a, we have a, a large scale. We have we have a project called Bridges. Basically, have like 800 uh, computer nodes, a couple of storage nodes. The 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 user request reports. Usually, we have a support team. This usually comes like like this. So, I cannot read this file. The file cannot be read. I, uh, LS is very slow. Uh, something like that. But. From a development point of view, from my point of view, you have to know how to produce this bug, right? Step by step. You can never expect a regular user to do things like that. You basically have to, to yeah. kind of reverse engineering of what has happened step by step, what has happened. So it's very hard to debug. Yeah. Kind of so I, my personal experience, I don't expect a lot of people have that level of file system, uh, file system uh, development experience to deal with this issue. So I don't think that we are, we actually, speaking of the people who are talking about this uh, funding for the software, we have a PSC, Piece of Super Company, we have been lucky to get some fundings from National Archive and uh, some deep project from National Science Foundation, so we got multi-million dollars funding. 
we have some good people working on this. So we have been lucky to get some kind of, my view is like side money to fund this project to this point. So we have, we have been in production for five years now. But the experience shows us, I would say, very experienced, very hard to do this. By the way, I used to work for a storage stop company, still, still running, so I have, I when I joined this PLC, they already, they already have some, uh, some project going on, like Zest used to pro produce this conference a while ago, 10 years ago. So um, my, my point is very hard to have a open storage uh, solution like the Linux. Linux is good for what? Write a device driver. Anybody can write a device driver, right? Anybody in the home, have a, you, you have a GPU, it's not that expensive. But to play on a storage, you need hundreds of clients. Hundreds, not hundreds, several, like 10 storage nodes, and you have, machine have terabytes. You cannot test that in your environment. You need a big investment to do that. Okay, thank That's you. So I'll let, thank you. I'll let uh, Peter and David have the last word on, on uh, uh, if you'd like. I think I'm leaving the panel very sad. <laughs> 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 I was hoping to, uh, to find an impassioned audience about open source storage software, but I don't, I'm not sure that I did. <laughs> well, I tried to get them to roll the beer barrels in at five, but uh, Ahmed is not letting me do that, are you, Ahmed? No, no beer barrels. Anyway, no, I, we're going to have to, uh, okay, you want one quick observation, and then you... I just wanted to offer one observation, and I love open source, and I love that you're up there. And my perspective is, open source and storage is young, very young. If you compare it to Linux kernel, who has been around, I think, 30 years now, so 25. you have a lot of time to grow. That's right. Thank you. Uh, David, any last thought? So I would just say, uh, last words, is that I think it's all level of exposure. Right? The Linux kernel has been around for 25 years, and people use it every day on their phones. No one's using exascale storage systems except for the people building them. Yeah. That's just where it ends. So I, I would just add one small thing, um, just to totally give a slightly uh, a different example, but in the same vein, that um, you can buy gear from Quanta, or you can buy it from Dell. But if you buy it from Dell, you're going to get a failure rate of, in the, the, you would expect, in the single digits. Um, and also, you'd be able buy to get it Oracle. back to Dell and get a new uh, unit very quickly. If you buy it from Quanta, you get a failure rate of somewhere in the range of 30% sometimes. So, and it, there are going to be all kinds of different failure rates, but it's significantly cheaper. So, if you want to invest in an engineering uh, team to uh, that specialize, that can test and uh, bring in the equipment and burn it in, you can save a hell of a lot of money, but you have to be willing to pay the price. So, it's so, the same thing for open source. to software and hardware. <laughs> so, this is perfect. This is a perfect uh, uh, seg into our next speaker because he's going to tell you you're wrong, but that's okay. Because <laughs> maybe you're right. I don't know. But uh, yeah, our ne your next speaker has got a different viewpoint. So uh, let's thank our panel. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack.